Aaron Burr Jr. was born February 6, 1756 in Newark, New Jersey. His parents, Aaron Burr Sr. and Esther Edwards Burr, had both made prominent names of themselves, with Aaron Burr Sr. being the second president of Princeton University, then known as the College of New Jersey, which was then a university meant for training Presbyterian ministers. Esther Burr, then famous for being the daughter of Jonathan Edwards, a powerful preacher and instrumental in the First Great Awakening, and now famous for the diaries she kept, giving in-depth perspectives of the current events and activities of her time. Unfortunately, Aaron Burr Sr. would die in mid-1757, and Esther Burr in early 1758, leaving Aaron Burr Jr. an orphan at the age of two. At the age of 13, Burr was admitted to Princeton, and received his Bachelor of Arts at 16 in 1772, but continued to study theology for a year and eventually went through the training to become a Presbyterian minister until the age of 19, when he decided to pursue law instead. He moved to Connecticut to study law, but in 1775, when news of the battles at Lexington and Concord had reached him, he enlisted in the Continental Army to fight in the Revolutionary War. He was acknowledged for his great spirit by then-Colonel Benedict Arnold, as they marched up to Quebec to meet General Richard Montgomery. Burr was promoted to captain by Montgomery and became an aide-de-camp, basically a confidential secretary to a high-ranking officer, which was relatively short-lived after Montgomery was killed in the Battle of Quebec on New Year's Eve in 1775, where Burr tried to recover the body of General Montgomery after his death. Over the course of the next four years, Burr would distinguish himself time and time again, preventing the capture of a brigade during the 1777 landing of British troops in New York City, defending the troops he commanded as lieutenant colonel in New Jersey, and in countless other battles. Due to his poor health, he resigned from the military in March of 1779, and continued studying law, although he would still be assigned on intelligence missions by General Washington on occasion, and help to rally Yale students alongside a Connecticut militia to prevent British troops from entering New Haven. Although he had made a big name for himself during the war, after the war is when his most significant accomplishments would come to fruition. He would serve in the New York State Assembly in the mid-1780s, fighting to abolish slavery, become the New York State Governor in 1789, and become a U.S. Senator representing New York in 1791 until 1797, which, as a reminder, was a position not elected by the people, but by the state government at the time. He ran for president in 1796 and received 30 electoral votes, which put him in a distant fourth place behind John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and Thomas Pinckney. He also played a leading role in the founding of the Tammany Society, later known as Tammany Hall. He transformed a social club into a political machine that would eventually help Jefferson to become president of the United States, due to its power in the political world of New York City. Now, this isn't particularly important, but it is a little ironic that, in September of 1799, Aaron Burr fought a duel with a man named John Barker Church. Now, if you don't recognize that name, I wouldn't blame you, but he was the husband of Angelica Schuyler, the sister-in-law of Alexander Hamilton. Church had accused Burr of taking bribes. Burr denied the accusations, and they both fought a duel. They shot at each other, and both missed. Church apologized to Burr for making accusations without proof, and the two men shook on it, surely a foreshadowing of events to come. Anyways, one of the first major confrontations between Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr can be traced to 1799, when Burr founded the Bank of the Manhattan Company, which would go on to merge with Chase National Bank in 1955 to form the Chase Manhattan Bank, making it the oldest predecessor of the J.P. Morgan Chase banking firm. The reason that this caused ire between Hamilton and Burr is twofold. One, it was direct local competition with the National Bank of the United States, largely pushed by Alexander Hamilton while he was Secretary of Treasury, as well as the Bank of New York, which was largely influenced by Alexander Hamilton, which would go on to merge with Mellon Financial in 2007 to form BNY Mellon. The second reason it caused so much ill will was because it was built on a lie, Aaron Burr, likely assuming that any charters to build new banks would be opposed and shut down by the Federalists in control at the time, instead made a charter that was said to establish a water company in Manhattan, something the area desperately needed. However, at the very last minute, he secretly changed the application to allow his 
water company to invest surplus funds in whatever cause he wanted. And once his application was approved, he just dropped the pretense of actually building a water company and made it a fully fledged bank. Angering many, specifically Federalists and more specifically Alexander Hamilton, on the simple fact that they had been deceived by Burr. Burr also used his bank to promote democratic republican politics too, directing money to people supporting the party and trying to upend the monopoly that Federalists held in that area. Now let's move on to where things will get a little confusing, the election of 1800. So contrary to what the musical Hamilton suggested, Burr and Jefferson weren't running against each other, but instead with each other with the intention being that Thomas Jefferson would be president and Aaron Burr would be vice president. Burr was a campaign manager of sorts, even going so far as to pioneer the modern act of canvassing people for votes. Now, just a really quick recap of the system America uses to elect the presidents, the people vote for a group of electors, who then go and actually vote for the president. It's a lot to explain in a short amount of time and CGP Grey does a great job explaining it in his video. Then, just as now, the electors actually get two votes. These days, the elector casts one vote for the president and one vote for the vice president. Back then, the votes were not distinguished between president and vice president. That meant that after the 138 electors cast their cumulative 276 votes, that left John Jay with one vote, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney with 64, John Adams 65, and 73 votes for both Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson, the Democratic Republicans. This was a major problem, and led to a contingent election by state delegations to decide on the President of the United States. Even though Thomas Jefferson had more votes than Burr did, he didn't have enough to push him over the threshold that was acquired only winning over 8 of the 16 states when 9 was acquired to reach a majority. Burr won 6 states, and the last 2 states were evenly split and thus going to no one. It stayed this way for 35 ballots, all cast through mid-February. And finally, Alexander Hamilton, one of the last remaining relevant political figures from the Federalist Party, weighed in, recommending that other Federalists vote for Thomas Jefferson because, even though he disagreed fervently with him, he trusted Jefferson more than Burr, who he saw as lacking principles. On the 36th ballot, this caused the two previously divided states, Maryland and Vermont, to vote for Jefferson, and two states previously in support of Burr, Delaware and South Carolina, to cast entirely blank ballots. This meant Jefferson won 10 states, Burr won 4, and two states casting no votes, leaving Thomas Jefferson as the third president of the United States and Aaron Burr as his vice president. During his time as vice president, he was mostly relegated to matters in the Senate, one of the responsibilities of vice president due to the fact that Thomas Jefferson didn't really trust Burr, leaving him shut out of party business within the Democratic Republicans. Overall, he was generally praised for his fairness, particularly in the impeachment trials of Justice Samuel Chase, with a newspaper saying he had conducted the legal proceedings with the impartiality of an angel, but with the rigor of a devil. When he inevitably left office following a new vice president being elected in 1804, it was said that his farewell speech, much of which has unfortunately been lost, made even his most aggressive critics be brought to tears. Because Burr was dropped from the ticket for the 1804 election, he decided to pursue a political career back in New York, running for governor against the relatively unknown Morgan Lewis. Much to his surprise though, he lost by a relatively significant margin and blamed his loss on a smear campaign he believed was being ran by his political rivals. During the campaigning for governor of New York in April of 1804, a letter from Charles D. Cooper to Philip Schuyler, Alexander Hamilton's father-in-law, was published in a newspaper. Dr. Cooper had written down the opinion of Burr he had heard from Hamilton, that Burr was a dangerous man and couldn't be trusted with having a position of power in government. Burr was infuriated by this and wrote to Hamilton, demanding that he either say these statements from Cooper were either true or false. Hamilton responded, saying that he should state specific statements from Hamilton directly, and not from someone else. It got to the point where Burr demanded that Hamilton essentially take back 
anything he had negatively said about Burr over the past 15 years. Hamilton, barely holding on to political relevance after the adultery scandal he had been through in the past years, figured that apologizing would ruin any remaining reputation he had with a people that still respected his opinion, namely the Federalists. He was probably correct too, because it was likely Burr would have published an apology in a newspaper to destroy Hamilton's reputation. Burr challenged Hamilton to a duel after he refused to recant his statements about Burr. The duel took place July 11th, 1804 in Weehawken, New Jersey. It's unknown who fired first, but both men did fire, although Hamilton was the only one hit in the duel. The bullet went in above his right hip and caused significant damage to both his internal organs and his spine, leading to his death roughly 31 hours after the duel and after being rowed across the river back to his home in New York. It is widely believed that Hamilton had no intention of shooting Burr, having religious and political issues with the practice of dueling, and also saying as much in a letter he wrote before the duel. Burr, on the other hand, is believed to have had the intention of shooting Hamilton, not knowing Hamilton's intentions about whether or not he would shoot, and also saying that he would have shot Hamilton in the heart if he had been able to see properly. Following the duel with Alexander Hamilton and his subsequent death, Burr was charged with murder in both New Jersey and New York, and avoided both states until eventually the cases were thrown out. Now, sources conflict on what the actual truth is, and I'll explain why I believe that is later. But as far as I can tell, after Burr left the vice presidency in 1805, he leased roughly 300,000 acres across where the border of Louisiana and Arkansas are today. Because sources are basically just hearsay at this point, based on who you ask, it's alleged that Burr went across Pennsylvania and Virginia to drum up support for people to move with him to the land he bought. He was also supposedly in contact with renowned Revolutionary War hero General James Wilkinson, who was also the commanding general of the US Army at the time. It's alleged that Burr was seeking to raise a small army to defend the territory against the Spanish if a war between Spain and America were ever to occur, as it was believed could happen at that time. It was also discovered that Burr had, apparently, been in contact with British and Spanish ministers, while also trying to raise money in order to either form an independent nation in the Texas territory controlled by the Spanish crown, or to overthrow the Spanish crown in Mexico in its entirety and create a Burr monarchy there. Burr was arrested in 1807 and brought to Virginia to stand trial for breaking the Neutrality Act of 1794 and was charged with treason. Now, the interesting thing here is that Thomas Jefferson really wanted Burr to be convicted of treason, going as far as to use his presidential influence as much as possible to withhold documents that might help Burr and to support the prosecution by offering protections to witnesses that could come forward to prove Burr's guilt. In the end, the only physical piece of evidence was a letter that General James Wilkinson had sent to Thomas Jefferson, which was summarily thrown out because it was discovered to have been in Wilkinson's handwriting, making it completely useless. On a quick side note, it was also later discovered in 1854, 29 years after his death, that General Wilkinson himself was actually a paid spy of the Spanish Empire something found by a historian searching through records in Madrid. In the end, Burr was found not guilty on the crime of treason because there was no evidence of any overt acts of treason. The Supreme Court Chief Justice John Marshall stated that the First Amendment protected Burr from being found guilty on intent alone, stating that the action of treason needed to be present, which there was no evidence of. Now, it seems the reason that there are so many conflicting sources on everything about the Burr conspiracy, even down to the acreage that he had leased in the beginning, is that there were so many parties with different intentions, but also very little documentation to accurately prove anything, with the only significant physical evidence being brought into the trial effectively being a doctored letter, the only thing left is hearsay which is almost universally seen as useless in the court of law, at least in this case. Of course, Thomas Jefferson's administration, who wanted Burr to be convicted, and Aaron Burr himself, who didn't want to be convicted, 
would have wildly different stories and interpretations of events. And without enough evidence to prove him guilty, he was acquitted. This trial was also a very important one for setting precedents in how legal proceedings like this would work. It helped to establish greater distance between the Supreme Court and the presidency, while also proving that the president was not above the law, after Chief Justice John Marshall subpoenaed President Jefferson, something Jefferson had fought against claiming certain executive privileges. Now, even though Burr was found not guilty, the country still turned against him, with effigies of him being burnt across the nation after reports of his supposed treason came to light. In order to flee both the condemnation and his creditors, Burr left for Europe. While in Europe, Burr lived in England for four years from 1808 to 1812, becoming close friends with Jeremy Bentham, an English philosopher who would be known as a principal founder of utilitarianism. Burr would bounce between Scotland, Denmark, Sweden, Germany, and France, eventually making his way back to America, although using his mother's maiden name, Edwards, in order to avoid his creditors. He returned to his law practice in New York, eventually finding a family within the Eden household after helping them with a financial lawsuit they were having to deal with. At the age of 77, in 1833, Burr married a wealthy widow named Eliza Jumel. The second marriage after his first marriage with Theodosia, lasting from 1782 to 1794, ended with her passing away. The marriage with Eliza was short-lived, however, with Eliza realizing around four months later that her wealth was being lost by Burr's attempts at land speculation and separating from him because of it. And, just to make the whole thing a little poetic, she chose Alexander Hamilton Jr. to be her divorce lawyer. One year later, in 1834, Burr would suffer a debilitating stroke, and would then pass away two years later on September 14, 1836, the same day his divorce with Eliza was finalized. Over the course of his life, Aaron Burr would father at least six children two of which were unacknowledged by him, and either adopt or help raise around five more. During his first marriage with Theodosia, he had two kids, the latter of which Sally passed away at the age of three. The older, also named Theodosia, would go on to live into adulthood, however, and was very well treated by Aaron Burr, who would go on to give her the same kind of education and trainings that usually only men at the time would receive owing to Burr's devotion to his daughter after his wife's death. Unfortunately, Theodosia Burr would also die an untimely death, being lost at sea either to a shipwreck or pirates at the age of 29 in January of 1813. His other children would go on to make names for themselves, with one of his stepsons from the marriage with Theodosia, John Bartow Privo, going on to become the first justice of the Supreme Court of Louisiana in what was then the territory of Orleans, and one of his unacknowledged children, John Pierre Burr, going on to become a significant abolitionist, member of the Underground Railroad, and chairman of the American Moral Reform Society. In the end, the most significant legacy of Aaron Burr are the two greatest shortcomings in his life. The rocky tenure of his vice presidency that ultimately led to the passing of the Twelfth Amendment and the duel with Alexander Hamilton that simultaneously aggrandized Hamilton's life and brought Aaron Burr's to a grinding halt. An often overlooked aspect of his political career, though, is his imprint on impeachment proceedings, and that his professional and impartial manner led to many customs that became a part of the system that we know today. Aaron Burr is a very complex man, and is often considered one of the most controversial founding fathers for this very reason. There are just as many reasons to respect him as there are to despise him, and there are those who say that the treatment he has received from history books has been too harsh, and then there are those that say it hasn't been harsh enough. To me, he represents that whole era in American history perfectly. From the surface, everything can be clear as day as to what intentions were, or why things were done. But if you dig down a little deeper, you find that it's a lot more complicated than that. Sure, Burr had shot and killed Hamilton, but he had no way of knowing if Hamilton was going to shoot and kill him. 
Sure, he may have been tried for treason, but he was ultimately found not guilty and there's little evidence for either side of the argument. And even though Hamilton the musical is very far from being historically accurate, it couldn't be more true to say that you do have no control over who lives, who dies, or who tells your story. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like or leave a comment. It really helps me out. If you want to stay up to date with my channel, go ahead and subscribe. If you want to stay up to date with me, go ahead and follow my Twitter. If you want to help support this channel, I have linked my Patreon as well. Thank you very much for watching. This has been Historical Hindsight, and I'll be seeing you soon.